All right, Chem 11, our next topic, um, it's actually the final topic in our quantitative chemistry unit, is percent yield. And we're also going to talk about planting corn today, obviously. Um, same format as usual, the brand new PowerPoint lecture note for percent yield is on your D2L site. I've got that drawn up right here so you can follow along with your notes and see what we're talking about. And then, of course, calculations and diagrams will be done here. So what we'll need for this lecture is your calculator matic 3000 solar powered edition so when giant solar flares knock out all the power on earth this guy will still be able to do his chemistry as well as your periodic table of matic 3000 super special mendeleev edition all right so you'll need those two things because we are going to do some sample problems um, in the presentation today. Um, so let's get started. So percent yield, all right? We'll talk about a farmer. My great uncle Neil, he had a farm. He grew a lot of corn, had lots and lots and lots of acres, tons of corn plants. Um, of course, as a kid, I'd go up to him, hey, Uncle Neil, all right? He was actually my great uncle, but hey, Uncle Neil, how many corn plants have you got? He didn't know. There was thousands and thousands of corn plants. I mean, he had a, you know, it wasn't like a one or two acre farm. It was a, it was a good sized farm, big farm. And so he'd say, I don't know, 10,000, right? Just telling the kid 10,000. But when he planted the 10,000, I'd say, oh, you're, you're going to get 10,000 corn plants then. And I remember him telling me, no, a few months from now, I'm not going to get 10,000 corn plants. And I'd say, well, well, you planted 10,000. Why are you not getting 10,000? You know, and I could hear him say now, hey, kid, that's what he called me, kid. It'll never happen. If I can get 75% of them to do their job and get to market, life will be good. That was his thing. If he could get 75% of the crop he planted to come through and grow normally and produce a good, health, healthy, bountiful crop, he could pay all his bills and have money in the bank and life was good, as he'd say. All right, but why not 100%, right? I can, I can hear myself as a kid. Why not, Uncle Neil, why not? Well, there's a few reasons. One of them was that some of the seeds just never took. For whatever reason, they, many of the seeds would grow a corn plant. Some of them just didn't. Maybe a mutation, who knows? Animals, Despite using different types of pesticides or different type of, you know, safeguards for his corn plants, raccoons, squirrels, whatever is out there, would still get some. That's just the, the way it is, right? So some of the animals in the nearby wooded areas, they'll come in and they'll sneak off with a few. There was a corn fungus that would get on some of the corn. Now, he'd use a fungicide to try to get rid of it or safeguard against it, but the fungus would take out a small amount every year. And then some fall off the harvesting machines or the truck and they get damaged. They fall to the ground and they get damaged or they get stepped on or whatever. Well, you can't sell those. Nobody's going to want to buy those ones. So you can see there's a few reasons here why some of his, you know, if we say 10,000 plants, maybe he only gets 7,500 to get his 75%. Where'd the other 25% go? Well, they were lost to these various reasons here, right? So this connects to the idea of percent yield. You know, what Uncle Neil actually taught me was a concept called percent yield. And later on when I was in chemistry, I'd be like, oh yeah, I know what he was talking about. So the amount of corn he planted, right? The 10,000 plants, that was his theoretical yield. If everything went absolutely perfect, right? If God was on his side and everything went absolutely perfect, no loss whatsoever, this is what you'd get. If I planted 10,000 seeds, I'm getting 10,000 plants, all right? The amount of corn he actually harvested from the field several months later, this was his actual yield. This is what you actually get. I know you planted 10,000, but you're actually only gonna take 7,500 from the field, all right? So that 7,500 plants or 7,500 plants would make the 75% to make life good, as he'd say, 
right? And sometimes he probably got 8,000 plants or 80% or whatever it was. But that percent was his percent yield. Factored into that 75% was 25% loss of corn due to those factors we just mentioned a moment ago. Chemistry is the same way. When we run a chemical reaction, there's the theoretical yield. The theoretical yield is the maximum amount of product that we get if every single bit of the reactants turned into product, right? So if every single bit of A and B turned into product, that's what our yield would be of AB. If every atom of this and every atom of that went through the normal process and connected together, that would be our theoretical yield. Our actual yield is what we get through actual lab work. When we sit there and we do it in the lab, that's our actual yield through actual work using actual lab processes and actual lab equipment. All right? The theoretical yield, that's not done in lab work at all. That's actually calculated. We use stoichiometry to figure out our theoretical yield. The actual yield is obtained through actual lab work. And the percent yield, all it is, it's a ratio of the actual yield in comparison to the theoretical yield. And then we multiply it by 100% to get the percent yield, right? So it would look like this, right? And I'll write it down here. I'll enlarge the formula. We can talk about planting corn in a little bit. So percent yield... is equal to, kind of crush that in there a little tight, is equal to our actual yield. So this is my, my lab work. And these are masses, so they'll be in grams, over our theoretical yield. The theoretical yield is what I calculate using stoichiometry, right? And then what I do is I multiply it by 100%. That's where the percent comes in. And if I look at this, I can see that grams divided by grams will cancel out. So these two G's will be gone and I'll be left with a percent, hence the term percent yield. All right. Why is the theoretical yield the one I calculate, right? This one is lab work. This one is calculated. Whoa calculated. Why is this one always the bigger one? Why is that the bigger number? And this one's always smaller. Well, there's several reasons. All right. The first reason why the theoretical or calculated yield is bigger. The first one is loss due to transfer. Think about taking a cup of water and pouring it into another cup of water, right? So you take the cup of water and you pour it into the other one. When you look at the, you know, the, the glass of water, the cup of water that's, you know, you emptied into the, to the other one, the one that just had water in it, but you poured it all out, you didn't really pour it all out. There's always those little water droplets inside of the glass. Right? If you do that right now, if you ran to your sink, filled up a glass full of water, and then poured all the water into the sink, when you look at the glass afterwards, you didn't pour out all the water. And this works the same way with powders, right? Uh, crystals, water, it's liquids, right? It's the same thing. We weigh out, oh, I weighed out 100 grams perfectly. I poured into the, you know, into the flask or into a beaker or whatever it is I'm holding, there's still a fraction of it that is left coating the inside of the container, right? So that's loss due to transfer. Um, the next thing, impurities. Impurities are substances that get into your reactants that shouldn't be there. You'll remember in, in your science labs in grade 10, right? You had substance A and substance B, 
right? Maybe they're powders. And there's a scupula for substance A. And there's a scupula for substance B. And you were supposed to make sure that the scupula in substance A is only used for substance A and the scupula for substance B only is used for substance B. And then you had that one kid, you're right, in your, in your class that used the scupula in A and then used the same scupula in B. And so now some of these A particles that are in here are now mixed in with the B particles that are in there. All right? And if we have to weigh out a certain amount of B, and there's a little bit of A in there because we use the same scupula for both substances, then you can't be guaranteed that if you had to get 10 grams of B that all 10 of those grams are substance B. There, there's a little bit of A in there as well. All right? And what impurities do is they cause side reactions, right? So even though we think we're getting all B reacting with something, those few A's that are in there could also react with it as well. And that's going to lower the amount of meaningful product you're going to get from that reaction. Lower energy inputs. Sometimes a reaction is supposed to be run at a very high temperature, right? And we don't run it at a high enough temperature. And so not all of the reactants are converted into product, right? Maybe it was supposed to be 200 degrees Celsius. You ran this at, you ran it at 180. Well, a little bit of that product wasn't formed because you didn't get it quite hot enough for all of the molecules to react. Old reactants is another reason. Um, some reactants have, a, it's like milk, right? There's a best before date on it. Because what happens is they react very slowly with components in the air, or some chemicals even react with light. So you can only have them around for a certain amount of time. What happens is they start to degrade. And when they, they decompose or degrade, whatever that substance is, it isn't that anymore. It's started to break down and it won't react and form meaningful product for you. And then of course, faulty equipment, right? Your scales could be off or sometimes I can remember um, building a distillation apparatus in uh, organic chemistry in university and we had a small leak in it and that leak was letting some of the distilled product escape the apparatus so when we waited at the end right we condensed the vapors that were formed in the distillation we waited we were a little bit short because we had a leak right the seals and the equipment weren't properly maintained that was actually me and my partner's fault but you can imagine if equipment is old or has a crack in it or just has some, you know, some sort of instrumentational error in, involved in it, then that can lead to problems as well. So all of these things can lead to a lower yield than what you're expecting, right? You're expecting that theoretical yield. Hey, I calculated it out. I use, I use scientific theory, chemical theory, and I didn't get what I expected. This is why your actual yield through lab work is lower than what you're going to expect when you calculate it. Uh, when you're in the chemistry, uh, chemical industry and money is on the line, the percent yield is quite often monitored several times throughout the day. And if they find the percent yield going down too low, it can lead back to corrections to machinery, equipment, lab processes, or the reactants being replaced altogether, right? And if all that stuff is found to be working just fine and the reactants are brand new, it might be your fault and it could be your job. Now, each industry accepts a certain amount of loss because they know this happens, but it can't go beneath a certain set standard that that company will have. In one reaction, the percent yield that's acceptable, there's no way you can go under 85%. If you hit 80%, and everything's go working the way it should, you're fired. Another reaction, its, its acceptable value for percent yield might be 70%, right? So each reaction has its own factors and own substances and own devices that it uses to proceed. So each reaction in a process has its own percent yield that each company will find acceptable. And you just have to stay above that. So now we're going to do some practice problems. I've got three of them here today. I'll read you the problem and then we'll do it on the whiteboard here, all right? The steps to solve are here. And there's really only two steps, 
right? But the first one does involve usually a few steps. So our steps to solve. We have to calculate the theoretical yield, right? Of the two, the actual yield will always be given to you in the question. The theoretical yields you have to calculate. And that involves using stoichiometry. So that could involve a few steps. And then we use the equation, the percent yield equation, and that's pretty easy. So the tougher part of this isn't the percent yield equation. That's easy. It's the stoichiometry. That's where people will mess up. So let's take a look at our first question. It says lead 2 nitrate decomposes thermally. We're using some heat. To produce lead 2 oxide, nitrogen dioxide, and oxygen gas. The balanced chemical equation is shown below. So there it is in bold. My recipe. When 3.31 grams of lead 2 nitrate is heated, the yield of lead 2 oxide obtained was 1.75 grams. Calculate the percent yield for the reaction. All right, so I'm going to move this out of the way so that I can do this question with you. All right. I am going to recopy our equation at the top of the board. So we had lead 2 nitrate, which is PbNO32. I really hope at this point that, you know, lead 2 nitrate, I hope you can do this like, you know, pretty easily now. Names and formulas are huge for us. We get lead 2 oxide, nitrogen dioxide, and oxygen gas. I'll spread them out because I'll probably be using mole ratios here. And to balance this thing, they had a two. This one, they gave us the equation. They gave us this, so it's nothing new. And let's see, what did I have to, what information was I given? I was given 3.31 grams of this. It said that I got this. And it wants the percent yield of this. All right, so what did they give me? Well, I have the mass of my reactant, and I have this. Now, for percent yield, I need two things. I need the actual and the theoretical. This is my actual yield. This is what they got through actual lab work. And it's in grams, so we're all good there. I have to find the theoretical yield. The theoretical yield is what you always calculate. So to find that, I have to turn every bit of this 3.31 grams into a certain grams of this lead 2 oxide. But I cannot relate this to this when it's in grams. Because this relates to this based on moles. It's the mole ratio, not the mass ratio. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide this by its molar mass. So I'm going to add up one lead, not two, just one, two nitrogens, and two times three is six oxygens. And when I add all of that up, it ends up being 331.2 two grams per mole. The grams divided by grams will cancel. I will be left with moles. And when I do that, it becomes 0 0.01 moles. All right, I'll move that a little bit closer there. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use my mole ratio and I'll bring it over here. 0 0.01 moles. And I'm going to multiply it by the mole ratio up here, head over heels. The head of the arrow is at two. The heel of the arrow is back where there is also a two, so that makes my math easy. And that's 0 0.01 moles of the lead two oxide. But what I have to find is the yield in grams. I gotta find its mass. So I'm gonna multiply this by the molar mass of that. I don't count two leads because that two is used up right here, right? I've used up the two twos. So it's just a PB and an O off the periodic table. 
and I'm going to multiply it by that. So when I take lead and oxygen and I add them together, I get this. 223.2 grams per mole. I multiply that. Moles on top and moles on bottom cancel. When I multiply it, it leaves me with grams. That's what I need. And when I multiply those, it's going to be 2.2 three two grams of the lead two oxide so this is my theoretical All right that's my theoretical yield it's the one I calculated my actual yield is up here so I'll try to get it in here if I can percent yield right is equal to my actual over my theoretical yield times 100%. The blue marker is fading on me. And when I put those values in, I'll get 1.75. That's the actual yield that I got through the lab work. The question said that over the theoretical which is the one I calculated here, times my 100%. Grams divided by grams will cancel. Come on, blue marker. I just need you for another moment. And that ends up being 78.4%. All right. And that is my answer. So not too bad, pretty good. Uncle Neil would approve. All right, so what you do now, pause the video, get this down into your notes, make sure it makes sense. I'm gonna set up our next question. All right, so I'm gonna erase it. Pause the video now if you need to. Question number two. Excuse me. I can put that right in the middle now because I will have to move it. Question number two. Calcium carbonate thermally decomposes according to this chemical equation. So it decomposes it into a couple of compounds. You are given 20.4 grams of calcium carbonate and are asked to make calcium oxide. This material right here. You are expected to do so at a minimum of 85% yield or you're going to be fired. All right, so they're telling you, hey, in our factory, we turn calcium carbonate into calcium oxide, and then we sell this. You have to run that reaction to make that meaningful product. And if you don't run it at an 85% percent yield, you're toast. So um, calculate the theoretical yield of calcium oxide, and then will you keep your job if you retrieve 10.6 grams of calcium oxide from the reaction? So this is our actual yield, because it says, you know, you, you retrieved it, you did the lab work, this is what you got. Are you going to be able to keep your job? So what we got to hope for is that 10.6 grams of calcium oxide represents a number higher than 85, right? This is not my percent yield. This is the industry standard set by the factory that I'm working in or the lab that I'm working in. So I got to hope this represents 85% or better. So let's see if, I, if we're going to keep our jobs. I'm going to move this. And let's do the question. <clears throat> the first thing we have to start out with, of course, is our recipe. All right. And our recipe is CaCO3, thermal decomposition. I'll put the little triangle there. We know what that means. It means we heated it up. And we get this and this. The beauty part of this is it's already balanced. All right, so all the coefficients are ones, but we don't see them. That makes our mole ratios really, really easy to work with. Now, what did it give us? It gave us 20.4 grams of that 
it said you managed to get 10.6 grams of this and that's our actual the actual yields always going to be given in the question all right and it wants to know just as a little side note it has to be greater than 85 percent to keep our job so we got to find the percent yield all right so i'm going to divide this by the molar mass of this so i add calcium carbon and three oxygens together using the masses off the periodic table and i end up with 0 0.204 moles all right so 0 0.204 moles. Now I can relate these. I relate things in an equation based on moles, not mass. It's not the mass ratio, it's the mole ratio. So I'm gonna bring that over. And my mole ratio is going to be, well there's a one here and a one here. So one over one, and that makes it pretty easy the number's gonna stay exactly the same. Only now it's moles of calcium oxide. What I'm looking for is my theoretical yield, because I already have my actual. So I gotta turn this into mass. To do that, I multiply by the molar mass of this. So I just add a calcium and an oxygen together from the periodic table, and that's 56.08 grams per mole. When I multiply, moles on top, moles on bottom cancel, and I'll be left with grams. When I multiply that, it's 11.44 grams. This is my theoretical. It assumes no loss. It assumes every single bit of this turned into this as much as it could. And it makes sense this number is higher than this number if you ever do a calculation let's say I did this and this was 9 and the question told me the actual was 10 I messed up somewhere my theoretical yield can never be lower than this my theoretical has to be higher than the actual and it is 11 10 so I'm following the rules all right I'm gonna use this space over here percent yield is equal to my actual yield over my theoretical yield times a hundred percent my actual yield was given it's 10.6 grams my theoretical, I calculated 11.44 grams. I'm going to multiply that by 100%. When I do that, grams divided by grams is no grams, and I'll be left with a percent. And that's going to be 92.66%. We are golden, right? Remember, the standard is 85%. We're killing it. We're in the 90s, so we're doing great. All right, you get to keep your job. So what you're going to do right now is pause the video, get this down into your notes. Hopefully it's making sense. But pause the video, get this down, take a look at it. All right, we've done this sort of stuff before. This is the new step, not too hard. But take a look at it, and then I'll set up question number three. All right, question number three. So it says there's a pain reliever, acetylsalicyclic cyclic acid. I know it's like a tongue twister. Acetylsalicyclic cyclic acid is this right here. It's C9H8O4, right? And how we make it is we take salicyclic cyclic acid and we combine it with acetic anhydride. I do not expect you to know these names. I'll be writing them up here and talking about them, so don't worry. And it says, when this reaction is carried out using 10 grams of salicyclic acid and 15.3 grams of the acetic anhydride, a yield of 9.2 grams of acetylsalicyclic acid was obtained. Calculate the percent yield for the reaction. I will go through this slowly. 
The names of some of these compounds are big, but it's actually still the same simple chemistry that we've been doing all along. So my biggest chore is gonna be to not mess up the formulas and all of that, to keep it neat. So, C7, H6O3, plus C4, H6O3, will yield C9, H8O4, plus C2H4O2. And what it says is you have 10 grams of that, 15.3 grams of this, and you got an actual yield of this and that's it and it wants the percent yield so we're looking for percent yield of this stuff all right here's my problem this one's got a couple a couple more steps to it but stuff we've already done before i have grams of this grams of this I I don't know what my limiting reagent is right I don't know which one of these I'm gonna run out of first which dictates the amount of this I can make so the first thing I'm gonna have to do is find my limiting reagent out of these two items so I'm gonna turn them both into moles and then find out which one I run out of first and use that one use my limiting reagent to figure out my theoretical yield of this the salicylic uh, acetylsalicyclic cyclic acid. So let's do that. I'm going to use their molar masses. All right, I'll do this one and tank over here. And the equation's already balanced, thankfully. So if I divide this, the molar mass of this is 138.13 grams per mole. When I divide this, I'm going to use the molar mass of this. So I add up four C's, six H's, three O's, and the molar mass is 102.1. All right. The 138.13 came from adding seven carbons, six hydrogens, three oxygens. So I'm going to turn them both into moles. When I do that, I get 0 0.0724 moles. When I do this one, 0.15 moles so I've turned them both into moles by dividing by their molar masses I'm now going to take this over and I'm going to figure out what is my limiting reagent and again luckily my coefficients are all one so I'm going to ask if I burn off every bit of this so every bit of it here how much of this will I need all right, so if I burn off every bit of this, how much of that will I need? Well, the number stays the same, right? So I have this many moles of that. So again, if we go back to our previous understanding, this is what I got. I got this much of that. I got that much of that. This is what I need. So let's take a look. I need 0 0.07 Two, four moles I've got 0 0.15 I have way more of this than what I need when all of this is burned off so what that means is that this is my limiting reagent all right I'll put that in a different color so it stands out this is the limiting reagent and this one is in excess all right so when it comes down to calculations, I'm using what I have of my limiting reagent, which is that. All right. So now what I'm going to do, now that I've figured out my limiting reagents, is I'm going to bring it over. 
and I'm going to multiply it by its molar mass. And that was for the acetosalic cyclic acid. So I add nine carbons, eight hydrogens, four oxygens, and that's going to be 180.17 grams per mole. When I multiply that, my yield will be 13.04 grams. The moles will cancel out. This is my theoretical yield. So now I can calculate my percent yield because I've got my actual yield that was given in the problem and my theoretical yield that I gained through proper chemical calculation, stoichiometry. So now I've got to do my percent yield. Now I've got to run out of room here. So what I'm going to get you to do is pause the video right now, get this down, and then I'll use up this space right here so we still have our two numbers that we need. So pause the video. I'm going to get rid of this. <coughs> And we'll get our formula down for percent yield. Percent yield equals actual over theoretical times 100%. All right? So our percent yield will be my actual is up there. It was given in the problem. 9.20 grams, our theoretical yield, 13.04 grams. And again, my theoretical, 13, is bigger than my actual, 9. I've done it right, or so it seems. And then we're going to multiply that by 100%. The grams divided by grams will cancel. When I divide those numbers and multiply them by 100, my percent yield is equal to 70.55%. Not as high as other ones, but again, each industry has its own standards. The standard for this could be 65% and I'm doing fine. Or it could be 85 and I'm going to be thrown out the door. All right? Anyway, that's it. Um, that's our three examples done. If we look here, you know what else Uncle Neil taught me? You can't plant corn and expect wheat. Now get to work. I'm going to put a worksheet up on our D2L site for you to do. So if you're in my class, you can start working on that. That'll be on the D2L site shortly. And um, that's it. I hope everything was crystal clear for you. I hope everything made sense. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, by all means, reach out to me through the comment section of this YouTube video, or if you're in my class, reach out to me through Edsby. All right? I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.